Welcome to today's episode of Equip, and I am thrilled today. We have a very special guest, um, apostolic leader, Pastor Dave Wells, he's with us today. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about him, um, him and along with his wife, Linda. They planted churches and Christian schools in Manitoba for over a decade. And then um, many years ago, they had moved to Regina and pastored Harvest City Church for um, over 23 years. And uh, from there, he turned over in 2010, he turned over the church to his son, um, Pastor Joel Wells. And now he is an apostolic team leader of numerous churches all across the world. And um, I am so thrilled to have him. He's ministered in such countries as, I wanna get them all, Guatemala, Ireland, England, Austria, Holland, China, Philippines, Vietnam, Marshall Islands, Zambia, Uganda, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, India, and Spain. And I know some of you watching today are from some of those countries. So you can tune in, because you guys are gonna love this. So um, welcome, Pastor Dave Wells. It's good to be with you today, that's for sure. So it's, it's so great to have you, I'm so yeah. excited. Um, so you are an apostolic leader over many churches. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But you, that wasn't always what no. you had dreamed to do in your life. No, it's about the furthest thing that I ever dreamed that I would do in my life. Okay, so, so. let's hear your story. Tell us what happened. Uh, well, I, I, w I was actually uh, born and raised in northern Manitoba, a town called Flin Flon, which is a mining town. And, and I grew up in a, in a, in a non-Christian home and uh, had no interest in God, didn't believe in God. My father was a professing atheist, and so I was too. I, I just thought that Christianity and God was a myth, really. Um, didn't believe they existed. Was not neutral about it. Was probably hostile about it. Mm. And so I never darkened the door of a church. I, I had no idea. Uh, about what church was about. I didn't know who Jesus was. I, I, I didn't own a Bible. I had never read a Bible. And then in my graduating year of university, I went to University of Ontario and I was newly married. And um, so the, my one church experience up to that point was the day I got married. We got married in a church. Uh, but that was my one and only church experience. And so one day I was just going home uh, after classes like any other day and it was about four in the afternoon. And I went into the school cafeteria to have a cup of coffee before I went home, and I, I had an encounter. I had an encounter with, with God. I, I, it, it totally astounded me, the whole, the whole experience, because I didn't believe in the supernatural, and all of a sudden, I'm having a supernatural experience, which frightened me, uh, and I, I just was stunned by the whole, whole thing. And what, really what happened in it was, uh, God began to put thoughts in my mind that I knew that were, they were not my thoughts. The, mm. They didn't originate with me. It was like somebody else was using my mind. And I, at that time in my life, I was a very goal-oriented, driven person at school. I had, I had a lot of plans, had a lot of dreams. Most of them had to do with making money, career. And so I was very focused at that time. And I had all, Linda and I had all these dreams and all these goals about what we were going to accomplish. And uh, what, what happened in this encounter was that God marched me down for the rest of my life and showed me, actually to the end of my life, and showed me that, so what? So what if I accomplished every dream, every goal I had? My life had no point because wow. I was going to die. And then what? And yeah. even if I made a pile of money and even if I had this great career and had all the material things that I wanted, I realized it, it didn't matter. Uh, that, and so I remember thinking to myself uh, during this is that if this is all life has to offer, what a ripoff, mm, yeah. what's the point? And it just was, so was a sense of futility came over me and I realized that my life is useless. So at that point, uh, two questions formed in my mind. The first question was, well, what if there is a God? Just mm. what if there is? And then the Good second question, question was, what if there is a, a heaven and a hell? Wow. And all of a sudden, pop, my, my mind came back. I was, you know, it was kind of weird. It was kind of almost like an out-of-body experience, watching somebody else use my mind, but I'm very aware of what's, I'm, it's just like I'm, a, I'm an observer of this, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of like back in my body, and then I just thought, what was that? Yeah, what's uh, going on what's here? Going on, what's going right? on? So then I, I was actually frightened. So I got up and I grabbed my books around to the parking lot. 
got in the car, drove home, and Linda and I had been newly married. She was a school teacher, and she had beat me home that day. And when I came into my apartment, she was doing something she had never done before. She was watching Billy Graham, famous evangelist, on television. And if I had not had that encounter, experience in the university, I probably would have changed the channel or said, you know, what are, you, what are we doing this for? Let's watch something else. But I just stood in the doorway for a minute, stunned that she was watching this type of program. And she was so into it that she didn't even know I was in the room. So I went in the kitchen, started trying to work on my studies. But then I, I realized after a while that I'm not actually doing my homework. I'm actually listening to this evangelist in the next room and realized also that what he's preaching about was what was going through my mind in the cafeteria. So it caught me. So I went and sat down and watched, watched for the first time I heard the gospel. Oh, wow. And I didn't, it didn't, uh, what was interesting about that was I was awakened to the fact that I was a sinner. Mm. And you say, well, well, didn't you know you did things wrong? Well, I did, but I didn't see myself. And I think that's true of most people who do not know Christ. They don't really see themselves as sinners. They see themselves as, well, I'm a pretty good person. Yeah. And so it was a shock to me to come to the realization that, no, I'm not a pretty good person, that I'm the guy that this evangelist is talking about. And um, if what he's saying is true, I'm in a lot of trouble here. Oh. So, um, so I actually had sweat running down my face. I was so convicted. <laughs> and I, I remember at the end of the program thinking, if this is just his opinion, then so what? My opinion's as good as his opinion. But if what he's saying is the truth, then I'm in a lot of trouble. Wow. But how to, I didn't know the answer. At that point, I didn't know the solution of how a person like me could have eternal life or how I could get rid of my sin. I, I, didn't, have, mm -hmm. I didn't have an answer. I, though the evangelist preached on it, it went over my head. I didn't, yeah, I didn't right. understand it. So the next night he came home from school, it was the same scenario. He was on again. So for three nights in a row, Linda and I watched this evangelist, Billy Graham, and we never talked about it at, at, at when, the, when the program was over. We never, we never talked about it. We never discussed it. We just changed to something else, and we, it was like zero conversation. But a couple of weeks later, um, I was driving to the university, and I found myself frozen at an intersection in my car. Like physically frozen? I, I just wouldn't go through the intersection. Oh, I was wow. just sitting yeah, at the stuck. intersection, looking both ways for traffic, and afraid to travel through the intersection, which was not my habit of driving. I mean, I was a fast and furious driver who never drove the speed limit. And here I am driving the speed limit, super defensive driver. Now I'm so afraid that I won't go through the intersection. And I, I caught myself sitting there. And I thought, why are you doing this? Why are you sitting at this intersection? Why will you not go through? And I realized I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I go through the intersection and I get hit by a car, I'm going to, and I die, I'm going to hell. Wow. That was, the, and I, I, it dawned on me, I'm afraid that if, I believe that when I die, I'm going to hell. Hmm. So then I remember sitting there thinking, is there any way out for a guy like me? Is there, how, do, how does a person like me go to heaven? How does a person like me get eternal life? Is it even possible? And I was, at that point, really skeptical whether it was even possible. And so I thought, I need to talk to somebody. I need to talk to somebody. I have a ton of questions. And um, so I thought, where am I going to find such a person? And I started thinking of my friends. And I thought, Mom, my friends are as lost as I am. They're not going to, they can't answer my questions. So I thought, I'm probably going to have to go to a church, which I did not want to do. Because I'm prejudicial. I'm prejudicial yeah. in my thinking. Well, you were an towards, atheist. I'm an atheist. Yeah. Well, I, I was up to that point, but my mind was changing about yeah. that. Uh, so we finally, because we, we'd gotten married in a, in a Presbyterian church, that was the only church that I was even felt like I was safe in, so we went to a big church down in the city, uh, but I couldn't meet anybody. Nobody would talk to me, mm. couldn't meet anybody, and finally we, I gave up on that after several weeks. But every time I get in my car and drive to the university, I hear these words in my head, you're going to hell. Um, you're going to hell. And uh, so I thought, I've got to resolve this. I've got to find out if this is true or not true, or this is just all in my head, or what's going on here. So I finally said to Linda, uh, let's try one more time. Let's find a small church in the slum of the city. Oh. 
Uh, so That's we, a so we, yeah, we just thought let's find a, maybe somebody would maybe we could meet somebody. So we went there the ver very first Sunday. The pastor met me at the door and said, asked me if, if he could visit me, and I said, yeah, you bet, you come and visit me. So mm -hmm. a couple days later, he showed up at my house. At this point, I am so desperate that when the knock came at the door and I opened the door and saw it was him. Actually, I grabbed him by <clears throat> his jacket and <clears throat> pulled him into my apartment, and oh. he was terrified. He thought I was going to beat him oh, up. No. He thought, <laughs> this is a trick. And I turned him, and I sat him in a chair. I was just that desperate. And mm. I said, no, you sit there, because I have a ton of questions I want to ask you. That's powerful. And so I, for the next three hours, I just started firing questions at him. And my wife sat in the corner didn't say a word the whole night. She just watched this exchange between me and this pastor. And at the end, when he explained the gospel to me, I was shocked because it was so simple. Hmm. And I remember thinking, what? It's Jesus died on a cross for my sins. Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, that's, and it's a free gift. And I just have to put my trust in that Jesus died for my sins and ask Christ to come into my life and take control and, that, and that gives me eternal life. And I just could hardly believe mm. it was, so, it was so, so great. In fact, I said to the pastor, I said, this is the best news I have ever heard. And I said, I'd have to be an idiot not to go for this. Yeah, because you're a smart man, you know, and very intellectual in a lot of ways. So, right. so to have something so simple come to you, um, it was probably pretty, pretty shocking in a way. Right. Well, I, I was, you know, I, I was a very good student at school. And I'm a very logical, linear thinker, mm -hmm. like one and one equals two. Yeah. And my, so my, my whole way of processing things and the way I think through things is very one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. I, that's the kind of, kind of the way I'm wired. So I'm looking, this has to be logical. But yeah. when he explained the gospel to me, it wasn't what I expected because it was very logical. Mm -hmm. And I realized immediately, this is the only possible way it could be. Yeah. If God doesn't give us eternal life, there's no way we could ever qualify. Mm -hmm. I understood that. And so I got my knees and asked Christ to come into my life and take over. And my wife actually was sitting in a corner watching this whole thing. And when I prayed to receive Christ, she just believed and she, was, she came to Christ too. So we both became believers at the same time. Wow. So you had an encounter. You and your wife both heard the truth, went to visit a church. A pastor came over. And then, boom, simultaneously, you both became believers. That's correct. That's an amazing, powerful testimony. And I hope you heard of all, all of that. Um, but, and then you went on and to do ministry work. So tell us how that happened so quickly that well, you just went that way. I think one of the things is that because I'm, a, because I'm such a pragmatic person, mm -hmm. either God is real or he's not real, either it's true or not true, so I'm, not, I'm either all in or I'm not in at all. I'm not half in, which I don't mm, understand, that, yeah. to be honest with you. So, Me neither. Um, <laughs> so we moved to, I graduated, we moved to Manitoba. I became a high school teacher. I started teaching high school. Went to a Bible-believing church, started growing, started reading my Bible for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, got filled with the Holy Spirit a couple years later. Uh, but one day... Um, one day my wife was downtown shopping and my, we had two little children we got at that point and they were both babies and I was babysitting and one afternoon I was reading Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 which says he chose you before the foundation of the world. Mm. And when I read that verse it kind of leapt off the page at me and it blew me away. I thought, I started thinking about that and I thought if that's true mm. that God already knew who I was and chose me before there were any planets in the universe, when there was no stars, when there was no universe, when there was nothing, he already knew who I was and he chose me. And I just, I just kind of fried my circuits as I started thinking about the ramifications of that. And so I thought, if that's true, then he's got to have a plan for me. Why would he choose me before he makes anything else and then not have a plan? So then what's the plan? Yeah. So I got, the, I got on my knees and I made a, I kind of made, I made a commitment to God and I said, I'll make a deal with you. Here's the deal. Uh, I'm trusting you that when I get to the end of my life, I, have, I want to be able to look back on my life and say, I lived out the plan. I can't stand the thought of coming to the end and realizing I missed the very reason why I'm alive. 
right. why I'm born. And so I said, that's my, I'm, I'm trusting you for that. Because I said, if you leave it up to me, I'll screw it up for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but I said, here's my part of the deal. Uh, your part of the deal is you get me there. My part of the deal is, is I'll say whatever, I'll go through any door you open. I'll never say no because of fear. Hmm. I'll never say no to you because I've never done it before. I'm not going to pry open any doors. I'm not going to make anything happen. If you open it, I'm going through it. That's the deal. So you just said, I'll say yes to, I'll say yes, Lord. Yeah, the answer is yes was the yes. question. Yeah. That was yeah. my attitude. Okay. Well, and, and earlier, um, you know, before you started searching, you had said one of the things that was revealed to you was that you realized you could live your whole life without living out your purpose. Right. And so now you were locked in with, the, with your creator right. Right. who knew your purpose. Right. So it was like a big turning point for you. Yeah, and purpose is a big issue to me. I mean, it was based on purpose that I became, you're right, that I became a Christian in the first place. Yeah. And so it, it was purpose, it's always been purpose that it's led me around corners. So three days later, I got a phone call from a pastor, well, not my pastor, but a pastor in a community. And he introduced himself and he said, Dave, we've been talking about you at our local ministerial meeting, which shocked me. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you, we know you're a high school teacher and you're a Christian. We want to know if you would start an interdenominational youth ministry in the high school, wow. uh, like a super youth group encompassing all the evangelical churches in the community. So I, my first thought was, no way. I mean, I've never done do anything. Yeah. So I'm going to say no. And the Holy Spirit showed up and said, what did you say to me <laughs> three days ago? And I realized it just kind of how fast things can go through your head. I, it's like time stood still and I thought, oh my God, he heard that prayer. Yeah, he heard that prayer. And, and I realized that right then I was at an intersection. And it, did I mean what I said three, years, three days ago or not? Because obviously God did because he was taking me up on it. So I was frightened. I had never done ministry before. I had no training. I didn't even know where to start. But I heard myself saying to this pastor, okay, I'll do it. And that was the beginning. That's how we, I got involved in ministry. So I started with the, this, and it, it took off. The youth ministry really exploded in growth. And we ended up with about 150 teenagers in the youth ministry. Uh, Powerful. And it just took off. And then we, Linda and I started leading people to Christ and um, praying and ministering to people, just people that we were in my job, people I was meeting. People started coming to my house. Uh, my house filled up with people. Eventually, these people started saying, will you pastor us, pastor us? And I said, no, I'm not a pastor. I'm not pastoring you. But they kept pressing me. And then finally, my wife and I, one summer, went to a Christian family camp uh, in the United States. And a prophet, and there was, the speakers there were from Australia. It was a man and a wife. The wife was a pro pro prophetess. And one night she pulled us out of the crowd and prophesied that for us to go into, prof into pastoral ministry. Into pastoral ministry. <laughs> so to make a long story short, um, we, a year later, I quit my job, and we just started planting churches and starting schools, and that's how we did it. We just, we didn't have any support. We didn't have any income. Um, I, we just felt God leading us to do it, so we just went out and did it, and that's, we did that for 10 years, and then, like you, as you mentioned in the beginning, came to Regina um, after that and took over a church that was in a bad place, and, and here we are. Mm -hmm. And you were at that church for I was 20, at that church for 20 years. Well, yeah, I've been there actually at that church for 30 years now. 30 years now. Because yeah. even though I'm not the lead pastor, I'm still on part-time pastoral staff right, there. Right. And, and now you're an apostolic leader. Yes. So, I mean, you don't call yourself an apostle, but you're an apostolic right. pastor. Right. Um, and you oversee several churches. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, when we came to Regina, the church was in such a bad place. And I realized how alone we were at that time. And at that time, it was in the, in the late 80s, 87. And at that time, there had been a lot of churches that had been planted and raised up during the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the mm -hmm. late 60s, 70s, which we now call the charismatic movement. Right, yeah. A lot of churches had been planted in that time, thousands actually. Mm -hmm. And most of these churches were independent and not connected very well. And so there were a lot of pastors like me out there that were alone. We didn't have any connections when we got, and so by the fact that I took over this church in Regina that was a broken church uh, that was disintegrating really and had some huge issues, uh, that, was not, uh, that was not uncommon. And so it drove home to me the point that we, we, need, to, we need to connect with other leaders and churches even just to survive. Yeah. 
So I called a, a friend of mine in British Columbia <clears throat> who was pastoring a church, and we had a conversation, and we agreed that we would gather our friends and pastoral friends and meet in uh, Medicine Hat, Alberta, uh, mm. for a conference at a hotel, and we did that. And there was about 100 of us showed up, about 100 pastors showed up. And we had a conference, we had a great time. We, and uh, we did it again the next year and the third year. And the third year, these guys started saying, we want something more than a conference once a year. Hmm. So myself and th four other leaders sat in the hotel room in Lethbridge, Alberta for three days and created a, a network of churches, which we called LifeLinks. And hmm. it basically, at that point, we were just trying to survive. We weren't thinking about the world. We weren't thinking about missions. We were just thinking about can we survive the ministry? Support each other. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. so then it, but then it, it took off. I mean, it, in the mid nineties, it, we started getting really involved in missions. And before we knew it, we were in several different nations of the world, which is where we're at today. Right. So you have churches now in Canada, the U S um, Africa, I think there's some yeah, England, a number of nations Europe. in Africa, Southeast Asia, um, Eastern Bloc Europe, uh, Europe, it's out the UK, um, Mexico, um, just a number of places. Just all over uh, the place. Yeah, it's yeah. just, yeah, all over the world, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've known you for several years now, and what I've come to know is that you are really a leader of leaders, you know, and um, uh, relationally, uh, you'll sit down and, and you'll just get to know people and, and talk to them and find out about them without you know, without trying to get them to be as part of your right. network or without those, you know, motives of, of building up right. the lifelinks kind of kingdom. Right. Um, so what kind of drives you to be so interested in leaders and, and to help them along? Well, I, I believe, Sherry, that that relationship is the key, actually, and that ministry flows on relational lines. Mm -hmm. uh, if your authority, relationship, true ministry always flows in, on relational lines. And so what you have relationally is what you really have. So I'm not much for positional authority. Right. I'm very strong, I'm a strong believer in relational authority mm -hmm. because I believe that that is way more effective. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's the reason. And, and um, I'm, a, I'm a pastor by heart, you know, at heart. I mean, I believe that pastoral ministry is a strong ministry gift for me. And so really I'm a pastor and mm -hmm. I, I so I just, I just enjoy that, and that's my style of leadership, and I believe that it's the most effective mm. leadership. I believe that discipleship, when you look at Jesus, look at his disciples, they were his friends. He called them his friends. Yeah. And that was his style of ministry. That was his style of leadership. When you, look at, when you look in the New Testament, you look in the book of Acts, and you look at Paul, look at Barnabas, they were highly relational leaders. Mm -hmm. yes. And they traveled in the company with other gifted leaders, prophets, evangelists, teachers, but the thing that, the glue that held them all together and even held the churches together and in the first century church was, they were relationally tied. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, and I'm, I'm a strong believer in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've gotten to know some of your leaders over the years and they are just some great men and, and women of character and um, just with hearts for God, hearts for people. Um, and, you know, one of the things that stood out to me was that you're a first generational Christian, right? right? God just sort of showed up on the scene in your family, right. starting with you and your wife. Right. And, um, you know, and back in 2010, you turned over the church to another pastor. You guys right. sought God on it. And your son is pastoring now. Right. Right. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, a family that wasn't serving God and, and you know, by right. your own words, you were atheistic. Right. And, uh, and, and now you have a, f a family legacy building right. where your son is pastoring. So just right. tell us a few, for a couple minutes about that. Well, I'm, you're right. I mean, I'm the first generational Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm, when I became a Christian, I was the first Christian in my family anywhere. Mm. There was no aunts, uncles, nobody in our family uh, was a believer. And Linda's family, she had one uncle that was a, a, a believer. Um, but other than that, we were both first generation Christians. And, you know, I, when, I, when I first was a brand new Christian, I would look at families like were, that had the grandparents, the parents, mm -hmm. and had, had family history, a Christian history. Yeah. I envied them. I looked at families like that and I thought, how fortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, they are to have such a heritage and and I thought I didn't I didn't come from that but I felt the Holy Spirit say to me you didn't come from that but you'll have that 
Wow. And so, um, and it's true. I mean, I, I'm, I consider myself a rich man today because my kids are serving the Lord and my, my grandchildren uh, are, are serving the Lord. And I, I believe that God's promise to me, if I, if I serve the Lord and I walk with God in my integrity and my wife does, I believe there's some strong promises in the scripture that God will bless my children and my children's children even to the mm. thousandth generation. And I'm, I'm holding them to it. So yeah. I'm, I'm believing for a strong legacy. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and I, and and you do. You have a strong legacy in your natural family, but also in your spiritual family right. with all the leaders right. you've been raising up and encouraging and supporting over the years, right. and and so that's just so ex so exciting. Um, you know, we're going to bring you back on the show again, and and I, we're going to talk about you being a leader to leaders right. and the making of a leader and uh, what you see in leadership and how you develop and and train leaders. Right. So, uh, so it's so great to have you here today. If you've been watching and you've heard Pastor Dave Wells' story, I hope you're encouraged today. Um, though, no matter where you came from, no matter what your family background, God has a purpose and a plan for your life. You know, if you don't believe in Him, um, like Pastor Dave was saying, you know, start to start to look, start to search, start right. to cry out for Him, and you will find Him. You know, the Bible promises that if we search for truth, we will find it. So, if you're not a believer at all, if you have a little bit of background or whatever it is, or maybe you just feel like you're not living out your purpose in life, remember this, God has a purpose and a plan for you. Um, don't go into that half-heartedly. You know, search for God and, and, and find Him. And if, you've, if you're living for God, but you're you know, maybe kind of half in and half out, I encourage you today just to change that and to say, God, you know what, you created me, you have a purpose and a plan for my life. And I just encourage you just to seek him and go after him. Put yourself around other believers, around a strong pastor that, that sees those things in your life and go after him full heartedly. So just thank you so much for watching the show today. Thank you for being on and, sure. and sharing your powerful story. Um, you know, and uh, if you have a testimony that you wanna share with us or a prayer request, or if you've been impacted by this program in some way, you can go on to our website at equipministries.ca and, and send us a note, just fill out the contact form and we'll be happily to be in touch with you. So thank you again for watching.